So we're going to resume our study this evening um, about the armor of God. We're going to be looking at the breastplate of righteousness. Of course, we have been looking at the book of Ephesians, taking our time to go through, and we will uh, continue this evening. Ephesians 6, 10 to 14 is our text. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Lord, we again come to you for help at this very important moment in our lives. Sometimes we perhaps don't appreciate that every little step we take, every moment where you have an opportunity to intervene in our lives is a very critical moment. Every Bible study, every prayer meeting, every worship service presents us with an encounter with the ability to be encountered with, by God. And so help us to, to make use of this moment and help, help us to make the moment count. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The New English Translation renders verse 14 in the following way. Stand firm, therefore, by fastening the belt of truth around your waist, by putting on the breastplate of righteousness. In our last lesson, we stated that in verses 11 and 13, Paul urges the believers in Ephesus to put on or take unto themselves the whole armor of God. And we said that the phrase the whole armor of God is a translation of the Greek word panoplia, which refers to the, com the complete set of instruments used in offensive and defensive warfare. In verses 14 to 17, Paul itemizes the offensive and defensive instruments that we are to employ in spiritual warfare. And we said that the items of armor appear in the order in which a soldier would put them on before engaging in physical warfare. The first piece of in equipment listed is the belt of truth. The belt of truth. Paul says, having your loins girt about with truth or fastening the belt of truth around your waist. And you remember we said that the Roman soldier's belt was his badge of office. It was worn with the tunic at all times and formed the central piece of his armor, holding all the rest securely in place. Truth. Truth. If we don't first 
put on the belt of truth, then the rest of the armor will be useless to us. It doesn't make sense moving to put on anything else if we are not girded with the truth. The belt tied tightly around the waist indicated that the soldier was ready for combat. Conversely, to slacken the belt equated with the soldier going off duty, something that is never to be the case with a Christian soldier. We noted that truth is the belt that must be fastened around the waist of a believer. The word truth is a translation of the Greek word aletheia. Sometimes these Greek words um, are used primarily for the naming of girls. But I've never heard a girl called Alethea. I've heard of Althea. But this word refers to what is true in any matter under consideration, opposed to what is feigned, fictitious, or false. That gives us a, a hint right away That gives us a hint right away of, of what we are dealing with when we talk about the belt of truth. We're talking about that which is opposed to that which is feigned, fictitious or false. That word aletheia is dealing with what is true in things pertaining to God and the duties of man, its moral and religious truth, sincerity of mind, and integrity of character, or a mode of life in harmony with divine truth. The idea is of the unveiled reality lying at the basis of an agreeing with an appearance. In other words, what you see is what you get. The manifested essence of a matter. If I say I am a child of God, my life must reflect that there must be a harmony, a balance between my profession and my practice. Truth is the correspondence between a reality and a declaration which professes to set it forth. Words are true when they correspond with objective reality. Persons and things are true when they correspond with their profession. Hence, a truth is a declaration which has a corresponding reality. If I declare that I am a Christian, there must be a corresponding reality. My life must demonstrate that I am a Christian. Since God is himself the great reality, that which correctly sets forth his nature is preeminently the truth. I think that may be the motive of the little hymn writer who wrote let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. Obviously, whatever God says is the truth. And the truth is actually embodied 
in the person of Jesus Christ. And if we belong to Christ, increasingly we must become embodiments of the truth. It's very important, brethren. I guess the word we are reaching for is integrity. We must faithfully hold to the truth of God's word. But it is also necessary for the truth to hold us. We must apply the truth of God's word to our daily lives and test everything by comparing it to that fixed and unchangeable standard. The word of God in every area of life. Brethren, whether we want to believe it or not, the Bible addresses every area of life. Every area of life. There is not one area of life that the Bible does not address. In fact, the first 11 chapters of Genesis If we understand the truth conveyed in those first 11 chapters, we are on solid ground. Solid ground. If we understand those principles, we cannot be led astray. What God intended for human beings is outlined there. He that made them, made them male and female. In every area of life that you can think about, principles are in the first 11 chapters that ground us truth. That's the standard biblical truth. The second piece of equipment listed is the breastplate of righteousness. And that's where we're going to spend our time this evening. Having girded his loins with the belt of truth, the Roman soldier would next fasten on his breastplate. And you have a little um, picture there of what the breastplate would look like. All of them didn't necessarily look like this, but that picture will give you a good idea of what the breastplate looked like. Have you ever seen a, 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 a bulletproof vest? It's kind of like that. It was the same. It protected the same areas. The Greek word translated breastplate is thorax, which according to Thea's Greek lexicon, refers to the part of the body from the neck to the navel where the ribs end. That's the thorax. According to the same authority, the word also describes a breastplate or corslet consisting of two parts and protecting the body on both sides from the neck to the middle. The breastplate was made of hard leather, bronze or iron and consisted of two parts, one for both the front and the back. They were connected by leather straps or metal bands passing over the shoulders and fastened in front and by hinges on the right side. The breastplate served as protection for some of the most important parts of the body. Underneath the breastplate was the heart, lungs, and other organs necessary for life. 
The breastplate of righteousness is covering those spiritual areas that are necessary for life. If a soldier did not wear his breastplate, he was vulnerable to an attack that could result in instant death. The Greek historian Polybius tells us that the breastplate was known as a heart protector. A heart protector. One commentator notes that, and I quote, as the soldier covers his breast with the breastplate to make it secure against the disabling wound, so the Christian is to endue himself with righteousness so as to make his heart and will proof against the fatal thrust of his spiritual assailants. The word righteousness is the translation of the Greek word dikaiosune. That word refers to a state that conforms to an authoritative standard or norm and is therefore in keeping with what God is in his holy character. God's character is the definition and source of all righteousness. This is very important, brethren. All of God's laws proceed from God's character. It is through God's laws, his principles, his judgments that we learn about God. And God's standard of righteousness is not ours. God is totally righteous because he's totally as he should be. And the more we conform to God's character, is the more we are as we should be. The righteousness of human beings is defined in terms of God's righteousness. What is God's standard of righteousness? Whatever God does is right. God is not subject to our interpretation of his actions. Whatever he says, whatever he does is right. That is righteousness. Not what we think should happen. Not how we think things should go. And brothers and sisters, God's laws are given to help us to live the best life that we can live. See, we think that God's laws are given to take away our fun and to restrict us so that we don't enjoy ourselves. Well, when we live in in when we repudiate God's laws and live the way we want to live, how long does our joy last? As it relates to human beings, Dikayosune describes the righteousness that is acceptable to God and thus is in keeping with his holy character. In short, the righteousness of God is all that God is. All that he commands, 
all that he demands, all that he approves, and all that he provides through the gospel of Jesus Christ, the perfectly righteous one. That's important. The righteousness of God is all that God is. All that he commands. All that he demands. All that he approves. And we are saying to ourselves, how can I ever measure up to that? But the righteousness of God is also all that he provides. And he provides it through the gospel of Jesus Christ, the perfectly righteous one. Now, uh, commentators, they have their views um, according, you know, they, 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 they have their views concerning what righteousness is Paul speaking of here. We're going to explore that. I'm going to tell you what my opinion is. It is my opinion that in the context of this verse, the righteousness spoken of, the breastplate of righteousness, the righteousness spoken of is both a justifying righteousness and a sanctifying righteousness. A lot of commentators argue that it is a sanctifying righteousness, not a justifying righteousness. But I think that it, it has to do with both. Let's explore it a little. And please follow me as closely as you can. When a sinner is regenerated, and as a consequence believes the gospel, and places his or her trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He or she is declared righteous or is justified by God the Father. So he or she receives justifying righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to such a person. And as a result, he or she stands perfectly righteous before God in a positional sense. It's important for us to understand that in a positional sense. God sees us as we stand in Christ perfectly righteous because his righteousness is imputed to us. Paul informs us of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. The New English translation renders the verse as follows. God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. In Philippians chapter 3 verse 8 to 9, Paul says, more than that, I now regard all things as liabilities compared to the far greater value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Indeed, I regard them as dung that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not because I have my own righteousness derived from the law, but because I have the righteousness that comes by way of Christ's faithfulness. A righteousness from God that is in fact based on Christ's faithfulness, New English translation. 
Paul says, when you find me, I want you to find me in the righteousness which comes from the faithfulness of Christ. His faithfulness, his keeping of the law perfectly, that is now imputed to me. I don't want you to find me in my own righteousness. Because that's going to be messy. As far as Paul was concerned, justification or positional righteousness was not only a past event, but it was a present reality. Concerning this, Jerry Bridges, the American theologian, wrote the following, and I quote, This is where so many Christians miss it. They can look back to the day that they trusted Christ. And if you press them on that, they will say, Yes, I was justified at that time. But today, they seek to live their lives as if it depends upon them. In their mind, they have reverted to a performance relationship with God. And so the thinking is, if I had my quiet time, and if I haven't had any lustful thoughts and these kind of things, then I expect God to bless me today. Isn't that how we are tempted to live, brothers and sisters? We want to pay our own way. We want to earn God's blessings. The Apostle Paul didn't do that. Paul looked outside himself and saw himself clothed in the righteousness of Christ. He saw himself declared righteous. For most Christians, it's a performance relationship. That is why we need a daily appropriation of the gospel because it is our nature to drift toward a performance relationship. What Jerry Bridges is saying is that you have to preach the gospel to yourself every day. I stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. My position is not due to anything I have done or can do. It is based entirely on what Christ has done for me. So, it's very important because you see, brethren, the devil will constantly seek to attack our standing in Christ. That's why I believe that Paul is talking about a justifying righteousness as well as a sanctifying righteousness because the believer comes under attack in that area. But in his reference to the breastplate of righteousness, Paul is not only speaking of, I have peaking there, but it should be speaking, speaking of justifying righteousness. He's also speaking of sanctification or practical righteousness. This righteousness is the product of the Holy Spirit in the life of the surrendered saint. This is not no positional righteousness. This is not about being declared righteous. This is now about an actual working out of the righteousness of Jesus Christ in my life. It is the righteousness spoken of in Philippians 2, 12 to 13. So then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, continue working out your salvation with all and reverence for the one bringing forth in you both the desire and the effort for the sake of his good pleasure. 
is God. New English translation. It is the righteousness spoken of in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as Jesus is righteous. That's the New English translation. So any Christian who says, oh, I can live any way I live because positionally I am secure. It is very doubtful if that person is really saved. Because the work, the work of salvation in the life of a genuinely saved person is always to point such a one in the direction of the character of God. And even if we take detours at times, there is something that brings us back. Paul is referring to both the imputed positional righteousness, which is the possession of all true believers, as well as the practical righteousness, which results from their exalted position. It is the righteousness of both standing or position and the righteousness of state or practice. It is not enough that we have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Our daily walk must be consistent with our position. See, the belt of truth would have us to understand that. To summarize, we may say that the new man who is clothed with the robes of Christ's righteousness and is therefore positionally righteous needs to practice what this privileged position entails. Paul speaks of this in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner for the Lord, urge you to live worthily of the calling with which you have been called. Live worthily of the calling. Yes, you have been called with a very high calling. So now I am encouraging you to let your lives be in harmony with that high calling. A high calling demands a high standard of living. Breastplate of righteousness. In other words, the believer is to manifest a practical righteousness each day toward God and toward men in his or her everyday life. Every believer is clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And by virtue of that has been made the righteousness of God. But he or she must also manifest integrity and uprightness in his or her personal life. We must live rightly before God and men, relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. So this, this all goes, see, see it's, it's seamless. That's what we have to understand about the gospel. Nothing is, 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 there's no unconnected area. Everything is connected to another area. With true gospel preaching and true gospel life. It's seamless. Like the robes of the high priest that some of us are reading about in Exodus. Was seamless. 
It was to be made of one piece of material. Have you noticed that? It's, 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 it's true, brethren. So Paul says, <clears throat> how, 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 how are we going to manifest this righteousness? Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled by the Spirit. You, we're not going to be able to get away from this. This is not something that we can produce by our effort. It is a surrendered life that Brother Nathan has been teaching us about. A life surrendered, yielded to the Holy Spirit that is going to produce in us this practical righteousness. Commenting, concerning, sorry, the breastplate of righteousness, expositors, Bible commentary says the following, and I quote, this attribute, the attribute of righteousness, must be understood in its full Pauline meaning. Pauline means of Paul. It's not Pauline, a lady by the name of Pauline. You will come across that in commentaries where you see Pauline. It's referring to that which Paul taught, the doctrine of Paul and Johannine, which speaks of that of John. It must be understood in its full Pauline, Pauline meaning. It is the state of one who is right with God and with God's law, righteousness. Listen now, it is the righteousness both of standing and of character of imputation and of impartation which begins with justification and continues in the new obedient life of the believer so expositors bible commentary agrees with my view has to do with both and it says this very important thing these are never separate in the true doctrine of grace. What, what is never separate? It is the righteousness both of standing and of character, of imputation and of impartation, which begins with justification and continues in the new obedient life of the believer. These are never separate in the true doctrine of grace. In the true doctrine of grace, nobody says, well, I can live any way I want to live because the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to me. No. No. And nobody ever says, I can live this righteous life on my own without reference to the fact that my righteous position has to do with the merits of Jesus Christ. The righteousness, he goes on to say, that is of God by faith is the soul's main defense against the shafts of Satan. It wards off deadly blows, both from this, this side and from that. Does the enemy bring up against me my old sins? Yes, he does. I can say it is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? Am I tempted to presume on my forgiveness and to fall into transgression once more? We are. From this breastplate, the arrow of temptation falls pointless as it responds, He that doeth righteousness is righteous. He that is born of God doth not commit sin. The completeness of pardon for past offense and the integrity of 
character that belong to the justified life are woven together in an impenetrable meal. There is no genuinely saved person who understands that he is clothed in the righteousness of Christ that, that does not long for a practical righteousness. We, we, any truly saved person longs to be more like Jesus. And Paul says in Romans chapter 8, that's why we groan in this body. When a believing sinner places his or her trust in Jesus Christ, and is born again or born from above, the very righteousness of Christ is put to his or her account. And this never changes. As the believer continues to walk with the Lord and yields to the indwelling Holy Spirit, sanctification occurs and he or she increasingly becomes conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. He or she becomes increasingly Christ-like. Paul speaks of this in 2 Corinthians 3.18. The New English translation renders the verse in the following way. And we all, with unveiled faces reflecting the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, which is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. One degree of glory to another, a transformation into the image of Jesus Christ. The breastplate symbolizes, <clears throat> sorry, the believer's righteousness in Christ as well as his her, or her righteous life in Christ. Satan is the accuser, but he cannot accuse the believer who is living a godly life in the power of the Holy Spirit. The life we live either fortifies us against Satan's attacks or makes us more vulnerable to these onslaughts. When Satan accuses the Christian, it is the righteousness of Christ that assures the believer of his salvation. But our positional righteousness in Christ without practical righteousness in the daily life only gives Satan opportunity to attack us. And here's the thing, brothers and sisters. Here's the thing, and we need to be honest about us. Perhaps the main thing that causes us to doubt our salvation is when we are not living right. Is it true or is it not true? That's how it is with me. The breastplate offered special protection for the heart. A warrior without his breastplate was dangerously exposed to the thrust of the enemy. 
there is no more effective protection for the heart than a walk in righteousness consistent with our position in Christ. If we are not living righteously, we are easy targets for the enemy's missiles. You know, I remember years ago, this might be as much as 30 years ago, a young lady, I wasn't, I don't even think I was a minister then, I know I certainly wasn't working at the church. She came to me and she said, Brother John, you know I'm very sick and um, I can't pray for the Lord to heal me because I'm not living right. And even though I really didn't know much about grace. Then I knew enough to say to her, you know, I called her by her name and I said, God doesn't heal us because we are good. He heals us because he's good. But she didn't explain to me what she meant when she said, she wasn't living right. But because she knew that she wasn't living right, it was difficult for her to trust God. You see how that is a double-edged sword, brethren? Because really, if she trusts God to heal her because she's living right, that motive is still wrong, you know? Because that means God is healing her based on her righteousness, her works. But when we are not doing so well, somehow we lose our assurance. You see how technical it is? I think of Saul, Israel's first king. It's a very painful thing for me to read. In that. Whenever I start to read the history of Saul, I get a pain in my heart. You may have heard me talk about this before because Saul seemed to start off so well. But we already know how he ended. And one of the things about Saul is that when, I mean, when he just became king, the Ammonites came up and they besieged Jabesh Gilead. I believe it was Jabesh Gilead. And they told the men of Jabesh Gilead that um, if they didn't surrender, they were going to gouge out their eyes and take them into captivity. And they said, give us a day to send back a reply to you. And they sent word to Saul. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul. And Saul said, where are the men of Israel? And they came to him. And he rescued Jabesh Gilead out of the hands of the Ammonites. But when he began to disobey the Lord, it was difficult for Saul to trust God for deliverance. Difficult for him. A person who is conscious of being in the wrong, 
will tend to cower or run away from the enemy. So again, brethren, let's be honest. If we are conscious that there is sin in our lives, sometimes we avoid prayer meetings because we fear that we will be discovered or we don't come to church for a few Sundays. A person who is conscious of being in the right tends to be courageous and is able to withstand the onslaught of the enemy and stand his or her ground. Practical righteousness involves a consistent safeguarding of the heart. It is not something that we piously and fraudulently parade one day a week on a Sunday. It requires integrity and vigilance. As the following scripture passages indicate, I'm going to read some passages um, reflecting the rendering of the New English Translation. Psalm 1914. May my words and my thoughts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my sheltering rock and my redeemer. You know the King James Version says, the meditations of my heart. My words and my thoughts be acceptable in your sight. Think about that. Think about ensuring that all our words, every word we speak is acceptable to God. But that wasn't even enough for David. He says, my thoughts are the meditations of my heart. Every motive must, will come under your scrutiny. And I would like for all my motives to be found acceptable to you. Psalm 139.14 Examine me, O God, and probe my thoughts. Test me. Know my concerns. See if there is any idolatrous way in me. And lead me in the everlasting way. Proverbs 4.23 Guard your heart with all vigilance for from it are the sources of life. Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Do not accumulate for yourselves treasures on earth. What a statement. Does that make sense to any modern person? Our view is accumulate treasures on earth. Now we have to be careful with this. Because Jesus is not saying that we are not to buy houses and so on and a car and so on. That's not what he's saying. This word accumulate carries with it the motive of just always wanting to gratify ourselves with things. Do not accumulate for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and devouring insect destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But accumulate for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and devouring insect do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Why, Lord? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Psalm 
some of us are in a position where it's difficult for us to be excited by the things of God. Why? Because that's not where our heart is. We are excited by gaining and by getting more power and being able to improve our standard of living. That's what excites us. I hope you don't think I'm saying that you mustn't, you know, try to do better for yourself in life and earn more money and all of that. I'm just saying, where is your heart? Where is your heart? Jesus calls us or the tumult of our lives wild restless sea day by day his sweet voice soundeth saying Christian follow me Jesus calls us from the worship of the vain earth's golden store from each idol that would keep us saying, Christian, love me more in our joys and in our sorrows, days of toil and hours of ease, still he calls in care and pleasure, Christian, love me more more than these. Mark chapter 7, 17 to 23. Now when Jesus had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. He said to them, are you so foolish? <laughs> Jesus could be rough, eh? You think he was rough? You think that was rough? Was he being too hard? That's not so important right now. Don't you understand that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, for it does not enter his heart? but his stomach, and then goes out into the sewer. This means all foods are clean. He said, what comes out of a person defiles him, for from within, out of the human heart, come evil ideas, sexual immorality, theft, murder, Adultery, greed, evil, deceit, debauchery, envy, slander, pride, and folly. All these evils come from within and defile a person. Breastplate of righteousness cover the heart. Brothers and sisters, we must not view righteousness as something that we do for God. Instead, we must view righteousness as the result, the result of our surrender to him and our adherence to his truth. What's his truth? The truth contained in scripture. The person who is lacking in integrity can offer no successful defense to the devil. A dishonest person is vulnerable at every point. Brothers and sisters, what 
But I'm saying here, I have proved in my own life, you know, I'm not throwing stones. When we live righteously, conducting ourselves in conformity to the truth of who God is and what he has said, life becomes a spiritual breastplate which protects our heart as we fight the spiritual war that we are engaged in every day. Let's just stand and give the Lord thanks for his word. Lord God, we stand in your presence and we are conscious that we are in your presence. There is something about your word when we start to handle it that causes us to be very sensitive to the nearness of your presence. There is something about your word that has the power to clear away all the obstacles and just strip us down. So here we are. Lord help us this evening not to think about a physical breastplate but to think about the fact that we are clothed in your righteousness and that reality causes us to desire to be right with you in a practical sense that understanding that you paid the price for us. You extended your mercy and your grace to us. That knowledge causes us. The more we understand that is the more we hate our sin. And the more we long to be like you. Deeper in thy love, O Jesus, doth my spirit cry to go until all my life is hidden deep within the cleansing flow. Deeper till at last in glory in his likeness I shall come. To be like Jesus on earth, I long to be like him. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in us. Help us not just to be satisfied and shout and sing about being clothed with the righteousness of Christ, which we should shout and sing about. But help us to shout and sing about our daily being conformed to his character. Help us to continue pressing on the upward way. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the exposure to your word and what is being wrought in our lives. 
and we say, lead on, Lord Jesus. By your grace, we'll go wherever you lead. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray.